All right. So uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. It's going to be like three more hot days, and then it's going to be in the low 80s starting next week. So uh, hold in there for a couple more days. It was really hot yesterday. This is today's CME code, Nesreb. They do try to make these pseudo words, don't they? I mean, they put the vowels in the right place. Uh, I just want to thank Maria for our Friday night at the Durham Bulls. I took those two pictures. The fireworks is good, except for the big foul pole in the middle. But uh, Maria set it up. I think there were upwards of 200 people there, and uh, it was a great event. So September is World's Alzheimer's Month, National Atrial Fibrillation Month, both of which I have, and Healthy Aging Month. Uh, today is Barbie Doll Day and Read a Book Day. Uh, tomorrow is World Duchenne Awareness Day. We'll put all these in there. I found out it was National Coffee Ice Cream today. Does anyone like coffee uh, ice cream? I love coffee ice cream. You put some chocolate chips in that and you've got like the absolute... All right, whoever's out there not on mute, please, I'll come through the internet and get you. <laughs> oh my God. So uh, today is the uh, uh, birthday of, um, what's this guy's name? R uh, Richard Roberts, yeah. Uh, Along with Philip Sharp, disco uh -huh. discovered introns and exons in uh, 1977. Before that, everyone thought genes were continuous. Like, why do you need space in between genes? But of course, that was a revolution. Again, somebody's not on mute. Please check. Okay, thank you. Who is G-A-W? Anyone who that is? Huh? Can someone text? Can I mute them? Huh. What was that mute all? Am I muted? No. All right. Well, thank you. Anyway, introns and exons, who would have thought? But a lot of neurodegenerative diseases are now related to this process with RNA editing. Okay, our own Birgit Frauscher was a senior author of a paper in clinical neurophysiology looking at the efficacy of targeting montages as opposed to high density arrays. And our own Sumisha looked at a commentary on people uh, smoking and other bad habits in MS. I bet it was bad. It's always bad. <laughs> Doesn't smoking decrease the incidence of Parkinson's disease? I think it's the one thing that smoking actually reduces your risk of. What do you love about neurology? Elijah Lackey says, uh, my chairman. No, he said, uh, because it's always got new treatments available and more are being developed and it's great to be part of that process. I find MS daunting because of all the really crazy names they have to learn for all the diseases they have. So anyway, this is today's CME and today's case presentation is our own Vincent Chang. All right, Vincent, take it away. Off you go. Okay, share screen. Which one is yours? This one? What is screen share? Okay. I think we're okay. This is too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take it away. Thanks. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure today to present to you a case on an elderly gentleman, 83 years old, uh, with history of seizures, as well as a diagnosis of essential tremor, who was referred to the Memory Disorders Clinic for memory loss. Kind of briefly on his story, he was diagnosed with essential tremor in February of last year. And then a couple of months after that, had um, what seemed to be a suspected journalized seizure at the time, it was thought that that was provoked in the setting of COVID positivity as well as alcohol withdrawal. Routine EEG at the time was normal. 
Uh, and then an MRI brain at the time revealed cortical atrophy in the parietal lobes, as well as right hippocampal atrophy. And then since that initial event, he had multiple episodes uh, that were suspicious for either focal impaired awareness seizures versus presyncope. He had um, what his wife would describe as facial paralysis, followed by transient expressive aphasia, and then nonsensical speech for less than one minute. This was associated with some visual darkening upon standing up. And when a cardiac workup that was negative for cardiac presyncope or syncope. And then a few months later, these episodes continued to increase in frequency up to 30 times per day. He also had worsening cognitive dysfunction uh, with memory loss, word finding difficulty, and um, issues with his executive functioning. He was then started on zanisamide and was referred to memory disorders. Labs at the time were normal, although he did have a history of hyponatremia. And then an ambulatory EEG revealed occasional bilateral independent temporal sharp wave discharges, which were um, concerning for epilepsy. A few months later, despite being on zanisamide and uh, having its dosage increase, he uh, continued to have these events and so was started on Keppra as well. And during the same month, uh, was seen in the memory disorders clinic where he scored a 22 out of 30 on the MOCA. He was thought to have late onset Alzheimer's um, and as part of the workup, a serum autoimmune encephalopathy panel was sent. And that was positive for Casper II IgG antibodies and nothing else. So briefly on uh, kind of an introduction on this disease, uh, Casper II is a membrane protein expressed in the nervous system. It's essential for the proper functioning and localization of voltage-gated potassium channels. And as a reminder, these channels are crucial in repolarizing the membrane potential. These antibodies may increase the expression of these channels in the inhibitory interneurons in the hippocampus, thereby promoting hyperexcitability in the hippocampus, which would presumably lead to seizures. They also decrease the expression of these channels in the dorsal root ganglion. It has a male predominance and has a median age at symptom onset in the 60s. And how does this present? Well, most commonly it presents as limbic encephalitis with seizures, uh, cognitive dysfunction, and short-term memory loss, as did our patient. Sometimes it can present with behavioral changes as well. It can present also as Morvan syndrome, which is pretty similar, but with the addition of peripheral nerve hyperexcitability, as well as dysautonomia or insomnia. Finally, it can also present as a movement disorder, uh, including a tremor, as did our patient. In terms of testing, uh, this antibody is part of the serum autoimmune encephalopathy panel. Um, although debatable and slightly controversial, uh, it may actually be more sensitive in the serum as compared to the CSF. And as tumors can be uh, associated with uh, encephalitides, it is important to consider malignancy screening. And uh, thymoma can be found in anti-CASPER2 positive patients as well. And it's also important to screen for any latent infections. Uh, this is more for a separate reason as relating to the management options, which I'll touch on now. Um, and these are the kind of the mainstay of treatment, including plasma exchange, IVIG, and glucocorticoids. And some second line immunotherapy options include rituximab and cyclophosphamide. And in general, patients do pretty well uh, and respond pretty well to immunotherapy with uh, only a minority of the patients, about 7%, showing uh, no response. And kind of to close the loop, our patient was admitted to the general neurology service um, and underwent PLEX uh, and received glucocorticoids with good improvement in cognition, and right now is being followed up by uh, Dr. Lackey for IVIG uh, therapy in the outpatient setting. All right, thank you very much. Very good job. All right, let me. Okay.
Okay, Tony, so this is yours. Okay. I make this big. There you go. All right, everyone. It's it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Anthony Gaianos. Uh, I think all of you know him much better than me, and he knows all of you, so probably needs no introduction. He's a professor of medicine an associate at the Duke Initiative for Science and Society and a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Human Aging. For all of you who don't know, Duke has one of the top three geriatrics programs in America, and he was here right at the beginning of it. Uh, he went to the University of Dayton and then the University of South Alabama College of Medicine, then his residency at UT Galveston came to uh, Duke. Did you do your residency at Duke too? Where was the residency? Oh, Galveston. Ta Galveston. Yeah, yeah. Then came to Duke for geriatrics and has stayed here ever since. How many years now? This will be 35. 35. Uh, for those who don't know, he started the geriatric consult service and started the uh, palliative care uh, service in 1998. So he's clearly someone who just sees things that needs to be done and jumps in and fills the gap. Uh, you were requested by our residents. Yeah, they wanted you to come talk. I think uh, one thing Suma and I had talked about is putting a little more emphasis on palliative care and hospice in the residency. It's something I'd never even heard of, but you know, it's a huge part of a lot of the patients we see. And uh, we're really thrilled to have you speak here today, Tony. Nothing says I want you like a check, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, but we work in two, don't we? Yeah, I, I, I get you. No, I, I know that what I talk about is not usual Grand Rounds topics, so I appreciate the opportunity, and I can tell you, <clears throat> I, obviously, I am in the talk for the group that I'm talking to, but I've talked to everyone from pastoral care to neurosurgery Grand Rounds, and to my surprise and also uh, pleasure, uh, the topic is actually there's some appetite for it because if there's one thing missing in our education is what to do at the end of life and after the end of life. The other thing, and Dr. Morgan Lander will back me up on this, the longer you live, the more your professional grief has to start interacting with your personal side. And uh, just two weeks ago, internal medicine lost a very dear nephrologist who was very involved with teaching and uh, did a couple of G-briefs or debriefs yesterday uh, in honor of uh, Dr. Evans. So um, I don't know why we don't talk more about it, but I don't know of anyone who's escaped it. And of course, it's really hard to communicate all the time, but particularly with families after a patient has died. And then as I just alluded, how do we support each other when sadness happens in our own families? <clears throat> this is the obligatory palliative care slide, but what I use it for I've been going to uh, palliative care lectures since 1995 and then started the program in, in 98. And these inverted triangles were always part of the consensus statement, the national consensus statement. We talked a lot about hospice and palliative care. That's a metric that the hospital cares about. So I would say to the young people, your greatest challenge going forward is to be who you are as a doctor and not someone who does metrics. The metrics are important. They pay the light bill, they do that. 
I'm not saying ignore metrics. I'm just saying, don't forget who you are before the metrics came. And then I never heard anyone talk about bereavement. And frankly, even though I was a geriatrician, I used to be the medical director at Forest at Duke, at least two to three residents of the forest died each week. Uh, the average age in my clinic was 83. I took care of people who were 104, 106, and did my best to give them a soft landing so that they died at the forest surrounded by people who knew them as opposed to the Mecca. So uh, the other really good thing this slide shows, and we were just, I loved Vince's presentation. There's something called anticipatory grief that happens at the time of diagnosis. And I know all of you have been in the room and had to tell a family a bad diagnosis and probably one they don't even understand. Uh, in my case, I met with many a uh, forest resident and their families around cognitive impairment and dementia. So there's anticipatory grief that both the patient family and the doctor have. And then there's acute grief, and there's a couple of more types that I wanted to cover. Um, Normal grieving is, I have one slide on that. Uh, the new diagnosis for what used to be called complicated grief is prolonged grief disorder. And fortunately, only 10% of families go through that where they've either been married for six decades, which was the case at the forest a lot, or they lost uh, an adult child, or someone that they, uh, it's really hard to overcome and be better in six weeks. I will say right from the outset, there is no timetable about grief. So um, in the old days when I was training, Dr. O'Brien, uh, Joel will tell you this, something sad would happen, your grandparent would die, your parents might die, and people would literally say, well, aren't you about over that by now? And that's, uh, don't do that. That's why I'm here this morning. Cumulative grief is something we clinicians experience. And I don't know why it's not in the literature, but cumulative grief, cumulative grief is someone like me who's been here 30 plus years, or Joel, we've seen so much death and dying. And at Duke, I can tell you, because I did the study, uh, our ICUs is where most people tend to die. And I really feel for the neurointensivist who uh, I've already met with, Dr. Shaw was very gracious. And um, this is something you're probably, you don't have yet, but you might get it and be kind to yourself when at some point a little voice goes off in your head that says, I've seen a buttload of suffering and of dying. Am I doing okay? <laughs> Do I need to at least share with somebody that cumulatively this is impacting me? And then disenfranchised grief, specifically around being an MD, is that you're not supposed to be affected by this. It's not acknowledged or socially accepted. And I have a great essay by a neurologist about that. So this is about cumulative grief. And this, uh, Deborah Umberson is someone that I know, and she's at UT Austin, a medical sociologist. And she used big databases to show that comparatively, as we go through the life cycle, and that's why I love working in the Center for Aging and Human Development, it's very life cycle oriented. Um, that African-American families suffer much more grief earlier and repeatedly than compared to their white counterparts. And I also wanted to, and, and because grief can have physical manifestations and impact health, her argument is that um, the grief of African-American families is just one more source of racial uh, disadvantage. But I also think the cumulative grief that we as clinicians stack up over time needs to be acknowledged as well. Disenfranchised grief is 
grief that's not supported by society. One really cynical way to explain disenfranchised grief, your family member died the wrong way. So it's very noble. And I rounded on 9,300 solid tumor for 12 years. That's where I met Vince. I tried to fail Vince, but he's now a resident. And, uh, and it started with Ryan. Um, but this is where uh, doctors are noticing, uh, they're debating, should I go to the funeral or not? Dr. Kim is a neurointensivist at Northwestern, wrote this lovely piece in JAMA a couple of years ago. And then she made the point at the end, and this is the, the bullet at the bottom that I want you to take with you. I hope that we can lift barriers that deny physicians the right to process our loss. I can easily tell you when I applied to medical school in 1982 or so, or 1980, uh, I had interviews, I had written a, I thought a thoughtful essay and people would drill me about, why are you worried about death and dying? You're a doctor, you're supposed to uh, carry on. And now I think the pendulum has swung back a little bit so that when we do have loss of a patient or a family member, we are at least can acknowledge that. And I'm really proud of the Department of Medicine for how they responded to Dr. Evans' death uh, we had a debrief for the house staff, we had a debrief for faculty, and people had a lot to say, which, uh, well, you know, when you get sick and you're at Duke, you have one or two choices. Do I go public or do I invest a lot of time and energy in keeping it private? And I think because of the age of her children, which is very young, in the beginning, Kim kept it uh, a secret. Uh, but as time wore on, her death was not unexpected, and she had started to share that she had been coping with a malignancy for some time. And, and that's another good point. Unexpected deaths are a bit harder to cope with than ones that are predictable. On the other hand, you can be as predictable as you want, and it's still going to kick your ass. It's going to hurt when it happens. At my age and after a prostatectomy, I have to take Ditropan and my mouth is dry as hell. <laughs> Although maybe too much disclosure. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, I know. Well, we're all clinicians. So what have you not heard or seen? I asked myself the question uh, because of some really strong patient and family uh, reactions over the years. Where do patients learn about this? And at first, you know, my first answer would be go into a drugstore and look in the Hallmark section and you hear a lot parroted that's on a, a sympathy card that people are saying in the hospital. But for, for me, most families learn this on the job. Uh, I had a cop from New York City many years ago on 9300 who said, a real tough character, but probably chocolate uh, gooey on the inside said, I've never died before. So you're gonna have to help me with this. And uh, what do our families and, and uh, patients think about us? I can tell you subjectively, no data, that they think we know a lot, not only about life and death, but about bereavement. Where do we learn about it? Well, I would love to say that all of us had a class or a module uh, on end of life care in our respective uh, professional schools. Certainly by the time, and I do a lot of debriefs with house staff, certainly once somebody becomes an intern, they go from being a very educated observer to responsible. And seen that on 9300 a lot where, uh, Several years ago, an intern was at his desk looking at the screen, had his hands poised to type, but was frozen. And I just kept staring at him for a half a minute. And then I went over to make sure he was breathing. And then to show off my clinical skills, I thought he was having an absence seizure. And then I just said, 
hits a name, let's call him Bob. That's not his name. I said, Bob. And he jumped and I said, you okay? He said, yeah. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm thinking. And I said, what you thinking about? That's called an empathic response where you don't say a terminating response would be stop thinking, do your work. It, uh, an empathic response would be, what are you thinking about? I was just thinking about that for the last six months of med school, I did nothing but drink and go to the beach. And now I'm taking care of stage four cancer. Really insightful comment from an intern in July. And then what I really hope in one of my pitches, one of the undergirding messages is that we start to learn it from senior clinicians. So great article in the ICU literature about what is our responsibility to our trainees to talk to them about death and dying and how it might impact them. This was written by a guy named Randy Curtis, who's famous in ICU circles for palliative care. And sadly, Randy died a year ago of ALS, way too soon uh, and uh, such a gift to the field of palliative care and ICU care. So at Seattle, where he trained, where he was faculty at Harvard VU, they used to have death rounds. And at the end of the week or the end of the month, they would review cases that impacted them. Not from an m, &M what did we do right, do wrong, but how did that case affect you? And it also was good for team building and acknowledging sadness on the part of the rest of the staff, not just the trainees. Here I've been doing G briefs for at least 12 years. Uh, and G briefs is also how I supplement my income. It's a lovely underwear line that I, it's a side gig. And uh, Dr. Morganlander who dresses very stylishly, I'm told where's the G brief. So, uh, uh, and there's a lot written, if you were to dive into the literature about the wellness, I mean, that's all right, two topics, right? Three topics, wellness, resilience, and burnout. Uh, the literature, it, I can't keep up with it. Uh, inner life of physicians and care of seriously ill is old, JAMA 2001. The three authors are all palliative care docs who also were either ICU doc and or oncologist. And their strongest recommendation of how to take care of yourself is to share with a trusted friend uh, what, what just happened. And I, I think that's still probably gonna end up being the number one recommendation. But I wanted to share with you in case you were not aware from the nursing literature, is something called the pause. So this article was written by an ER nurse at UVA and after a code, he noticed that people just cleaned up the room and went about their business and scattered. So they have a policy there now going way back to 2014, where at the end of a code, particularly if it was unsuccessful or very sad or unexpected or a young patient, they just stand where they are and have a moment of silence. No prayer, no singing, no kumbaya, just to acknowledge that this was a person who might have been a brother, sister, dad, mom, and also to acknowledge the effort that the team made to save the patient. Uh, one of the things we lack in a medicine that sports is full of is a pat on the back and a comment to say, job well done. I noticed that the chair said to Vince after his presentation, really good job. Um, in the 80s, when I trained, you never would have heard that. Now, if you, if you messed up, you, were heard, you would have heard about that. And it wouldn't have been polite feedback. It would be, you effed up, Galanos, and you need to do X, Y, and Z. Um, great article, Archives of Neurology, going all the way back to 2011, also at the University of Washington, where they mimicked what Randy Curtis was doing in the MICU and started to have what are called death rounds. Again, it was not to do an m, m but to talk about the cases that impacted the trainees. And um, they published this, and the 
discussion amongst the trainees was what was crucial. And most of the residents, there were only 26 and it said a single center, but most of the residents said that it was very helpful about teaching both about end of life care and providing some support to the house staff. So this theme of peer to peer is uh, really important. I think nobody knows what it's like in the trenches, like you and your fellow folks in the trenches. Uh, interestingly, the satisfaction rate was a little bit lower than what I would have expected, uh, but many of the neurology residents said, I like to process things by myself and public expressions like this are, they're not comfortable for me. Another thing that we can do, and I'm sure we've all had mentors who said, if you had a really sad case, write a letter to the family afterwards and say what a privilege it was to be involved in the care of Mr. Smith, uh, for example. Again, this is not a new article, this is 2001. And people like Harvey Cohen, who's my mentor still, he'll be 104 next week. And uh, uh, Dr. Nilan, these are guys uh, and women who hand write notes to people to say what a privilege it was to be in their care. When I was the medical director at Forest at Duke, I did this, like I said, weekly, and I would try to incorporate something personal about the patient, say, I really enjoyed how much Mr. Smith loved his Tar Heels. We talked ACC basketball and I will miss that. Something that lets the family know that you actually knew their loved one and cared about it. So a little bit of audience participation. Uh, there's no right or wrong. When you look at this picture from Time Magazine, what do you see in this young woman's face who's acutely grieving the loss of her partner after um, a traumatic attack on a bridge? Sadness? Disbelief. Disbelief, that's huge. One more thing, anybody? Can't be wrong. Sorry, pain. pain. And the, I, you guys, you guys got it. Um, you do not need the glanose module on empathy. Uh, by the way, I am giving surgery grand rounds in January, and I might bring along the glanose module on empathy. Just being smart ass. Uh, the one thing I would point out to you from experience utter exhaustion. So a couple of things happen to people who are in acute grief. They cannot show up for their part in the relationship. So if you have a friend who experiences a terrible loss, expect that. They have no energy. It's so sapping and it does induce cognitive impairment. I'm so glad that I trained at the forest at Duke because I learned so much from those folks in one of the things I learned is that grief really takes time and I'll be back. But in that first six weeks, six months, there's a new normal and you have to give me time and space to express that. Single person is missing and the whole world is empty. It is impressive how much grief can make you feel that way. I would also point out that Joan Didion is a famous author. And in her book, The Year of Magical Thinking, she actually comments on medical care at Duke quite a bit, and it's not favorable. That's why I asked the original question in the beginning, where do patients and families learn about uh, end of life care and bereavement? So I have a different kind of disclosure to, to make and I myself have experienced personal grief. And I like an essay that I ran into that grief can divide your life into the before and the after. And because Nick, my son, and people like you to use the name of the person uh, who died, uh, because he died at home, uh, it was an automatic medical examiner case. I would point out to any of you who are parents he died in mid-September, but the autopsy did not come back to mid-January. 
And I wasn't surprised to learn because Nick and my daughter have had uh, type one diabetes, Nick since he was eight, Rachel since she was six. And um, he had had, he had always had a very brittle type of diabetes, meaning uh, he had been in DKA before and knock on wood, my daughter never has. And I would say that even though it's almost five years, I'm still grieving. I still think about Nick. Monday night at the game, my buddy wasn't with me. And I never apologized for getting emotional because that's where we F up when we don't allow people to express what they're feeling. That, that doesn't help. Most of you guys know that not only am I from the great state of Alabama, a fashion mecca, um, I am a Greek. And so uh, grief is both personal and cultural. So when we were sick growing up, it's like right out of the movie, I would have a bad fever and my mama would say, I make lamb. She literally said that and we fed everything, whatever was wrong, grief, illness, cancer, we tried to feed it. So I gained a lot of weight right after my boy died and I'm working on that. I would say the one thing that still plagues me and I've looked into the parental grief literature is I don't really sleep that well and um, working on that, but I know what it's from. So I've made up an expression, it's just grief so that we don't pathologize grief. And then I went to the literature like a good academician and tried to find something that would be of help to me. And I really just found a bunch of terms, anticipatory grief, prolonged grief disorder. Uh, so I made up a word that helped uh, ex uh, describe what I was going through, grilt. So this is a word that combines the grief that a person might have, but also that little guilt factor about did I do everything I could to prevent what happened? So this is both for families and for clinicians. All of us have heard a family say, I wish I had made my husband go to the doctor sooner, or I wish we had gotten to Duke sooner. On 9300, the solid tumor service, I heard that every week. I wish we had come here first. And then I think it's um, important that you know you and I are obsessive, compulsive, competitive people. That's why we do what we do. And it's really hard to imagine that maybe we miss something. But I would point out this last quote, um, to seek a listener and not a problem solver. Uh, the gift of presence and the perils of advice. So when you're in an in m, &M that's a one situation. But when you're sharing with a friend or colleague your feelings about a patient or <clears throat> someone you care about personally, this is really important to be more of a listener than a talker. Again, way back to 2001, and I want you to notice that the first author who is now famous in grief and bereavement is a PhD. And this whole article in 2001 is what is what are the shortcomings of physicians when it comes to end of life care and what she calls aftercare? And then she made these two tables where she, I thought it was a little demeaning towards the medical profession. Here's what you can say. And then another table, here's what you should not say. So I, once I got in, involved with this, you guys might know Paul Reardon. He's a, med psych trainee here for five years and then did a year of palliative care fellowship. Uh, and then we put together this group of all Duke researchers. Megan is now a intern, uh, second year resident at Hopkins and Greg is a fourth year med psych resident. And uh, we got Dr. Pergerson and myself. We wanted to write something practical because we also noticed that even palliative care doctors struggled with what to do with this topic. The last three tips are really important. Uh, hospice does in fact, and there's data for this, that the longer you're enrolled in hospice, 
the better your post bereavement adjustment. Uh, I wrote tip number nine, we'll cover that. And then last but not least, we tried to find literature um, that showed a link between professional grief and burnout. So this is what the psychiatrists say. But if you just, here's the burden of this slide. Just look at normal grief and look at how impressive it is. Recurrent feelings of yearning for the, the deceased. Struggle to accept reality. Somebody said disbelief when they saw that young woman's face. Uh, I'm a testament to either loss of appetite or eating everything and sleep disturbance. And at some point feeling disconnected. Uh, you know, bosses and supervisors have a job and that's to keep the, the wheels rolling, right? And I remember someone coming to my office on behalf of the boss uh, after Nick died. And they said what every boss says, uh, take all the time you need. And then they said what many Duke bosses said. Uh, by the way, take all the time you need, but when do you think you might be back? And then I said the most brilliant thing I've ever said, uh, besides I love football. I said, if I came back in two years, it would still be too early. Because that person didn't know anything about grief, obviously. And um, I'm glad I said that because it just came out without much thought. But fortunately, all of these things tend to abate or become manageable in six months. And only 10% of people who are grieving qualify for prolonged grief disorder, which is grief that doesn't get better, grief that paralyzes someone. They're not able to go back to work and they're not able certainly to give a talk on grief and they don't have any social function. And these are folks that we as clinicians should refer to a, a grief counselor. I've learned th uh, that Duke Hospice has four certified grief counselors and you don't have to be enrolled in hospice to utilize their services. So prolonged grief disorder is the new DSM category. Also, uh, we wanted to give people not a script, but some advice about what to say and not to say. So picking up on that 2001 JAMA article on what not to say, um, they're in a better place. Call me if you need anything. That's kind of an empty gesture, candidly. Uh, the worst one I got was, I know how you feel. And then I would say, oh my gosh, did you lose a child? And they would say something silly like, um, my dog died. And uh, it actually was more harmful than helpful. <laughs> uh, it's God's will and everything happens for a reason. And we have to be careful that the platitudes we express might be making us feel better, but how do they land with our friend or colleague who's grieving? So we came up with some simple stuff. Um, I'm so sorry you have to go through this. Uh, when you feel ready, I can come over to help clean. Or when you feel ready, uh, Dr. So-and-so, talks to faculty who've had significant losses. I can't imagine how you're feeling. Uh, I imagine it's really tough. My favorite one, and I should bold this sometime, is um, if you had the time, so this is where sincerity and being genuine really matters. Uh, tell me about your husband. Tell me about your son. Uh, at the Forest at Duke, I'll tell you one quick story. There was a couple who'd been married almost 70 years. The husband dies. That night after work, I drove over to be uh, with the widow. And she said, Dr. G, I'm so glad you're here. Wait one minute. And she goes uh, in her cottage to another room and comes out and has a picture of a young man and puts it on the mantle. And she said, my son died when he was 19 and was at Duke of meningitis. And my husband never allowed us to publicly mourn him. And though I'm sad to lose my husband, 
I get to grieve my son. So then I said instinctively, not because I'm smart, but just because I was struck by her story. Tell me about your son. And uh, it was wonderful. So these are just a couple of suggestions. There is no data on this, by the way. There's no evidence based. Here's what you say. Here's what you don't say. And I would one other thing that's particularly hard for male physicians. Sometimes there are no words and you just sit with them for the time that you have and you don't say anything. And if you noticed in the picture of the young woman, the, her parents are holding her, but they're not saying anything. So allow yourself not to know what's the right thing to say. The best book on grief is Megan Devine's It's Okay That You're Not Okay. She has uh, sections on how to support a friend. Don't give a timetable. Don't ever suggest they should be getting over it by now and be willing not to have any answers. You know, the, the power of presence, the perils of advice. And follow their lead. Uh, one of the things I would tell you is that when I did come back to work, people would see me and not everyone knew that Nick had died. And I thought I had given instructions to my department, please tell everybody, I don't wanna still be talking about this raw a year from now. And that's exactly what happened. There would be people who would stop me and this went all the way to two years, uh, actually two years plus after Nick died. And you'd be on the ward, you're doing your job, you're holding it together. And then somebody, because it's convenient for them says, oh, I heard about your son. Can I give you a hug? And I would say, yeah, but we're on 8,100 and you're the GI consult. Let's just do the work right now. And I'll talk to you offline as young people say, or at another place. No one respected that boundary. They just thought it was fine to just, because it was convenient for them. If I can give you a real pearl that'll help your colleagues as you go through life, ask before you start talking. Um, and there are some things, it's really hard for us as docs, there are some things that really are not fixable. So I do not look at grief as a, a pathology or something to be fixed. I'm just grateful when I'm around people who understand and allow me to talk about Nick at the football game or uh, don't just sit and stare at me, which was <laughs> by far the number one reaction when I came back to work. Um, I think we've covered this. Uh, the last bullet's really important. Uh, my daughter was in PA school when Nick died. And when she got back to school, there would be patients that reminded her either the same age dark hair, look like Nick. Nick looked just like me, so very good looking. And uh, I'm well preserved. And, uh, but what we can do is when you know there's a trigger, if you can step in and take that patient uh, or that shift until somebody has a chance to gather their sea legs. This is a great book. Dr. Harold Kushner is actually Rabbi Kushner. And his son, Aaron, died at age 14 of progeria, uh, rapid aging. I know you know what it is. And this book is old, 1981. And it's hard to know what to say to a person who's been struck by tragedy. It might be easier to know what not to say. Anything critical of the mourner, don't take it so hard, try to hold back your tears will not land well. Anything which tries to minimize the mourner's pain is probably for the best. She's better off now, is likely to be misguided and unappreciated. Uh, I think these are wise words that are now 40 something years ago. And he makes the hypothesis in his very short book that one of the ways medical people, but people in general try to make sense of tragedy is to feel that somehow the person who's undergone tragedy somehow deserves it or did something to bring this onto themselves. 
And that way we can keep the world orderly by saying everything happens for a reason. I don't think any of us would say that the people in Hawaii who died in those fires somehow did something to deserve it. I will share another quick anecdote. Um, it would just been a couple of weeks since Nick had died and I was hiding in my office and a faculty member came by and said to me, you know, Tony, you're already a really good person. You didn't need this to make you better. I had no clue what this gentleman was talking about. So I'm very good at funerals because uh, I've been to so many. And I just, I knew if I didn't give him a task, he was going to sit there and shout pl platitudes at me. So I, I told him I needed a certain item and he left and uh, is yet to talk to me about that. And it's been almost five years. So he meant well, let me get, let me be sure to say that. Great doctor, known him a long time, nobody in this room, but what a crappy thing to say to a grieving dad, as if I needed this to become a, a better person. Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I Have Loved was written by our own diff school professor. Let me tell you something. Every medical student knows this book uh, and they adore her. Uh, I know Kate, I like her a lot too. Um, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer and she was told that she was going to die and to get her affairs in order. That's all in the book. Uh, she has an appendix and two appendices. Never start a sentence with, well, at least. Well, you can have another baby. Or, well, they're at peace now. God needed an angel. Because all of these statements, like Rabbi Kushner talked about, tend to minimize what the mourner feels. And uh, I also want to, I like her, everything happens for a reason. This minimizes the mourner's pain and implies that there's a reason for this death or a bad outcome, which is my segue to say, there's a lot of literature in neurology that talks about the grief providers feel, I don't like the word provider, doctors feel when they do a procedure and the outcome is very bad. So we're not just talking about death and dying. We're talking about how hard our work is and that many times, despite our best efforts, we have a worse outcome than death. When I spoke to neurosurgery, they really uh, resonated with this and the Q&A was all about uh, efforts to make a person better, but their functional status was compromised. Um, according to Dr. Bowler, uh, hospitals tend to treat people like cyborgs <laughs> or throwaways. Uh, I would agree with Kate on this. The truth is no one knows what to say. Sometimes just showing up and not saying anything is your best play. And this is why one of the kind residents uh, knew that I'm now part-time and partially retired. So not so that we get it right because no one knows what's the magic word, but so that we do it better. And the only medicine for grief is acknowledgement. Hence, I was so grateful when the first person uh, that said to me, tell me about Nick. It was two years after Nick had died and it was a relief. And then I know you're worried about, well, did I talk for a half hour without taking a breath? No, I talked for 10 minutes and it was just great that someone was acknowledging what I was going through. Um, I still have grief attacks. So if a friend of yours has had a significant loss, they might come back to work and there'll be a trigger that seems to be benign, but um, it'll cause an intense reaction. If you can just sit with that person till it blows over, cause it will, and you will have grief attacks all the way for a long time to come. And uh, my last grief attack was Monday night when Duke beat the hell out of Clemson. So I was both happy and sad. I did do a podcast based on, uh, and I turned it down when they offered it to me, but after a couple of people said the stories I've already shared with you, I thought it was important to do that. And I do lean on friends, the house staff, after I lost my prostate, 
gave me uh, the Prostate Bowl, which we play every January. And this is a gamish of mostly residents, but a lot of fellows and some attendings. And I would like to say that we should prepare patients and families for what's coming. Uh, I know we do that more now, so I applaud you for that. And we might be able to identify the family member who's going to have the most trouble uh, with the death. And fortunately, at Duke, we have all kinds of resources, hospice, pastoral care, social work, caring for each other, and uh, doing debriefs after a difficult death. We've talked about writing a letter of condolence. And then I want you to consider uh, where you were. What, what would you want? And most I see I'm up against the, the rail. Most people want to talk with their fellow peer to peer. And if you knew that these things were at Duke, how many of you, you utilize them? And this is hospital medicine, none. And then we repeated the QI study in December and no one. So uh, personal and professional grief, please take care of yourself as well as your staff. And the burnout in neurology, I always look at burnout when I give a talk to whatever division it is to see if in their literature, they're looking at grief as a potential source of burnout. And even though this was a very strong editorial, we must identify the root causes of burnout at no time in that article or in previous articles did they look at grief as a source of burnout. We've studied this. And the bottom line is this, an oncologist here at Duke, that uh, for every point they endorsed on the grief scale, there was an increase in odds of burnout. And this abstract has been accepted at ASCO. All the authors are house staff plus myself, and I think we're on to something. So in the future, we can do better at looking at the drivers of burnout. We need grace and space. Give yourself time to process the hard parts about your, your work. Lean on people like Morgan Lander and Laskowitz and Bradley Coles and Dr. O'Brien, the old man himself. And thank you for the opportunity. That's my email. And I appreciate your attention. Sorry we had to speed it up. Thanks. Thank you for that extraordinary talk. Uh, questions? Stories? I think you can you can't go wrong with first step. Yeah, the the question was, when you know there's tragedy, do you? Well, by the way, I started palliative care, so I can tell you. In the beginning, the only time I got called, guess who was my number one referral source in 1998? Neurosurgery, because they took care of wealthy people from all over the world who did not want to leave Duke. And so I got a lot of business from them and we built a good relationship. But I want to just show you all the things that are, these slides are yours. I put them here on purpose so that you can see what can happen uh, at Duke. I think you start with the palliative care consult, but just know that both for your family and for yourself, it's great to ask. You ask, of course, permission. Would it be of help to consult uh, with the chaplain. I, I used to tell patients because I was a doctor until the end of June, we've got a chaplain every 15 feet. Would you like to talk to one? Um, that sometimes was a yes and sometimes no. And then they really want to talk to the attending because they want to understand what happened. They don't understand what happened. It gets so complicated. So um, I learned that as an attending, but I've also learned it being on 9300, that to the extent the providing team can prepare them for what's about to come and break it down in their language, 
I think that goes the furthest way to helping a family cope with what happened. And I'll send the slides up to you. Yeah, that's a great question. And you've always been perceptive and the $5 is in the mail for you. So I have a strange thing going on. I mean, you might find that hard to believe, but uh, my dog, Daisy, she's five years old, healthy as can be. And whenever I walk her, I'm already grieving that yeah. she might pass. Yes. What's that? <laughs> I think you nailed it, Doc. So um, animal grief is real. Uh, there's so many types of grief. I'm collecting a group of specialists at Duke, but there is a social worker at Duke that specializes in grief of animals. And I didn't mind the guy saying, uh, well, I did when he compared my son to a dog. And my first thought, Joel, you'll love this. He's one of the few people that's not bigger than I am. And my first thought was, I can take him. Just knock the shit out of him. And, and then I calmed down. And he kept talking about his dog. And then he started crying. And then I grabbed him. And I'm Greek. I, I held him. And he cried in my chest. And then he got over that. And then when I pushed him back, I just said, teachable moment never compare an animal to a child only because it doesn't land well. Yeah. But it's what he cared about in the moment. And all of us who've had animals know that when they die, it's like a family member dying. And you can have anticipatory grief. Our Bubba, our rescue bulldog, uh, my daughter, uh, had him for 12 years. And when he was diagnosed with cancer, her anticipatory grief was off the charts. And um, she, we still grieve, Bubba. Um, so I think you're a pretty normal guy. And the other thing I tell house staff is if you're not, you know how all of y'all are partnered up now and the, you do the match with another person on that? It's all new stuff, really, relatively speaking. So when I do debriefs with house staff, it's very interesting. Those who have a partner tend to say that they go home and share it a little bit or a lot with the partner. There was this terrible death in the MICU last year and the house staff were shaken. And there were six house officers and the first five, I always ask, so how did you cope with that? What'd you do when you went home that night? And they all said they talked to their partner and got to number six. This is really instructive. And as a young man, and he said, well, I don't have a partner. And I'm just as moved by this death as my colleagues are. I said, so what'd you do that night? He said, I put on videos of my dog back home because my dog's my best friend. And I got to tell you, when I was a resident and I was, I was married then, I didn't think I should burden my layperson wife with the bullshit at UT Galveston. So I, I had a dog named Christmas and I talked to Christmas every night when I got home. And I uh, wrote a paper about it that got published because <laughs> Christmas was the perfect example. He would listen, sometimes even turn his head, though I think that was just to get a treat. And I could talk to him ad nauseum and he never left and he always listened. And then you give him a treat and they go lay down and then you go to bed. So I think the power of animals has been underestimated. Good question, Rich. Look up that article. Okay. Christmas. Yep, there's a lot of good stuff here. Yeah, thank you so much. That's my, that's my crew. Well, thanks for allowing the topic. Oh my God. It's your money. Are you gonna uh, pay the honorarium? Or yep, is yeah. Dr. Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Right. We'll go back out to breakfast time. Oh,